Wheels are turning and we're in. Hamtag is back. Hamtag. Hamtag. I just had Mike Brunella on and I would mention Hamtag and he had to go Hamtag like that. <laughs> it was perfect. Let's see. We've got Vorpal Bite is in already and uh, and uh, he's already like looking forward to maybe what would be maybe his Avalon Hill games and his victory games. So we don't know what we'll do next. We've kicked around some topics. Um, now, what's very interesting is I'm still getting used to, well, not used to StreamYard, but so Vorpal's commenting, but it's showing we have zero eyeballs watching currently. <laughs> so before we get in, let's real quick, I'll touch on what the topic is, but then we'll catch everybody up on our break between shows. So we are moving into, Tom Knight is in as well, and Nathaniel Robinson, oh. Uba Beck. Now we got some people. Um we are going to be doing our publisher series where we're going to be doing our top five games from a publisher. And we will set the stage with the first game we got from that publisher and the last game. Of course, those may or may not be in the top five, probably not, but you never know. And we're beginning with GMT. So today will be our top five GMT games as it says, or published games as it says in the title. But Judd, first of all, I like your shirt. This is my boomstick. <laughs> that is a reference for those who don't know to Army of Darkness, one of the great, one of the all-time great actors. He should just get an Oscar, lifetime Oscar, for just being Bruce Campbell. The man is legend. There you go. And you know, I think I've seen parts of it, but I've never seen the whole thing. You got to have that on DVD, right? Yep. Really, the thing I've been getting into him lately is um, Burn Notice, because with the Corona thing, that's yeah. why I stopped watching Star Trek. It's just because, man, my wife and I got hooked on Burn Notice in a big really? way. We're just binging the heck out of it right now. Hmm. I've seen a few of those. But, uh, well, and then, of course, we've had a break in filming. We were on a very good track record where we were just boom, boom, boom. And then uh, I got put on zero days off, two weeks, seven days a week, basically, 14-hour days. I've got kids upstairs, so you're going to hear some laughing at that. Um, and we were forced into hiatus for a little while. So now what have you been doing the last three weeks? Oh my goodness. Wheeling and dealing. Oh, really? Okay. Say well, no. What are you doing? Okay. Last time I think we talked, I had just got five magazine games from Roger McGowan for making that Vassal module. Right. I knew you Yeah. That was like the deal. Okay. Then I got in a pay it forward. <laughs> And got West Front, Med Front, and um, Euro Front. And then he mentioned something about upgrades, and I didn't know, know what he's talking about. It had Euro Front 2 in it, along with the upgrade kits to turn West Front into West Front 2 and East Front into East Front 2. Wow. So I did convert my East Front over, restickered it, popped the stickers off, redid it, had the giant maps. West Front, I just bought extra blocks, extra box had the maps, and I've got basically duplicate copies. Now I've got base, what amounts to East Front 2, West Front 2, Euro Front 2, and then I still had the first version of like four of the games. I guess I'm going to trade them or something because I'm on the second version. Um, I traded for a couple of magazine games, old s and on Mon Battle of Monmouth, and I think it's um, Valley of something. It's a David Martin game on Gettysburg Day 2. Hmm. And then I just pulled a trade for a game that's going to be mentioned on my GMT thing here on my most recent. And let's see. Oh, I also traded for Agincourt. I had to look at the pronunciation Agincourt. It's part of the Men of, Men of um, Iron tri um, series. And I ordered okay. the tribe pack. And nice. oh, then I got Sign of the Pagan by um, Richard Borg from Victory Point Games. Because Victory Point Games kind of no more, and the designer's been taking their designs. And since he's no longer with us, I thought, I don't think this thing's going to get reprinted. How many games do you have on Attila the Hun? And the store in Oklahoma City, my wife is driving down to Dallas. So I wrote, dropped them a line. And that's funny, I took a photo when I was there last time. And I said, here's your shelf. Here's the game. Do you still have it? They said, yeah. So Game HQ. Yeah, game, game, yeah. game HQ. Yeah, so... I've just been wheeling and dealing and playing stuff like just crazy. Oh, I also traded for um, Dunkirk. No thanks to you putting it on that review. And I was like, oh, I need to get that one. Yeah, I like that. And um, 
uh, Pemberton and Grant Civil War game. I actually traded with Grant Wiley, so it's like getting perfect insuring copies. So yeah, I mean, man, I've just been just Trader Joe seriously right these days. Sweet. Now, are you back to work? Or are you still? Uh, oh what yeah. Are you doing? Uh, oh. We've had um, one day furlough a week, and I just call it War Game Mondays. Ooh. Pro nice. tip. Pro tip. Since nobody from my work will see this and think of this to beat me to it, if if you have a day off, take Monday off. Because you sit around Sunday saying, I gotta go work tomorrow. Instead, you go, Woohoo, I'm off tomorrow. Where everybody's yep. usually kind of tapering down, casual Friday. And plus, a lot of people take Friday off, so you don't have to worry about people coming by bugging you. <laughs> so, anyways, I would say take Mondays off. So, I, I started War Game Mondays back up, something I used to do when I pile up all my vacation and then just take a ton of Mondays off and learn a new game and then play it on Monday when I got like, you know, eight hours where I can play it. See, and that's what I have. We work where I'm at, 410, so I always have Saturday, Sunday, Monday off. Sweet. Yeah, so and I agree with you. I am trying, uh, we've got Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, but this is a rum, a 16-year-old rum. They do rums and Armagnacs and sometimes cognacs, so that's what I'll be sipping on here as well. All right. Sipping on Wichita water. <laughs> Woo, that's good, too. Also got a little bit of Diet Coke candy, but uh, not mixing the two. Let me do a little call off here, and then we'll get into what we're doing. Um, we got Tom Knight, <laughs> and uh, he's saying Bart's top will be Combat Commander. Vorpal Bite, Lucky 13, James Brazil, Kabuki Kid is in. Let's see, Uva Beck, uh, Timon 62, or Timon 6219, Trevor Just. Uh, I'm popping up. Make sure I didn't forget anybody. Nathaniel Robinson. Um, I think, I think that's it as I pop up. All right. If I miss somebody, I think I said Tom Knight, you guys can get me. All right. So GMT, um, Oh, Matthew Albring is in and Tony Holton is in as well. Okay. So well, Trevor right. just you will be so jealous. I've got the 1988 A's. He's talking mm -hmm. about Stratomatic Baseball. Nice. I got the Bash Brothers and Ricky Henderson. <laughs> so to set the stage with GMT, we're going to start with what was your very first GMT game, if you know? Yes. You want to go or um, well, I will tell you this one was tough. I believe it's definitely my oldest or in there is my uh, Thunderbolt Apache leader, 1991. But this I picked up. I didn't get it when it was brand new. So I'm in this haze of was Twilight Struggle the very first game I've got from GMT in like, what was that, 07? So it I might. Think it's 05. Yeah, I think it's 05. 05. Okay. 05. It might be that was my first purchase but it would have been right around the same time as this and i can't remember for sure so i might have picked this up early because i love the thunderbolt the warthog and the whole apache and and support of the troops but it is quite possible that my first purchase could be twilight struggle because when that thing landed it landed big time and uh, Greg Schmitkins showed that to me on the table and walked me through a turn. And, and I just loved the whole Cold War, you know, the way it encapsulated that. So that's an unknown for me on the very first, but I think it was Thunderbolt Apache Leader. Mine was easy because I got right before I found BGG, I was getting into the American Revolution in a big way. I mean, this kind of dates it, but I was running to Borders Books, gobbling up. Books. I was on their book clubs. I get stuff for like forty percent off. I mean, mm, I love Borders. Henry Knox, Green. I'm mean, just reading Battles. I'm, I'm just tons. I just can't get enough of this stuff. I find BGG. Um, I start looking up American Revolution games because I, you know, found out war games are still around. And um, We the People was the first big one. And the other one I kept reading about. I had never heard of GMT, and I got the game. And then I started figuring out are these guys the new Avalon Hill, mm. and it was Saratoga. Nice. Part of the Battles of the American Revolution series, and in my book, the very oh, best one of all of them. It, nice. The rules were tailored to this game, and the others, you're trying to force a rule set onto other battles, and often it does not work, especially Monmouth, of which hmm. you cannot repeat what Green did. But this one, it was set up very, as you know, you know, 
they're fighting over Freeman's farm and it's such a tight, compact space. You don't have to worry about artillery ranges because if you're in the open, you're going to reach in that spot. Yeah. You know, um, rifle, the rifle rules, the tactics, everything. And this was so cool. I played this. I have a, I'm sorry, after action reports on BGG about this. Mm. I played this back then. I need to play that with you. I'm literally right at the part. I'm reading the book that you recommended, Saratoga. Frazier just got shot in the stomach. He saw the, they even name him, um, the, the, the rifleman that shoots him while he's perched up in the tree and hits him in the belly while he's on mm-hmm. horseback. And I if, just, um, got- if you go to, um, Vassal and look up the game turning point by Richard Borg, mm-hmm. Berg, I'm sorry, Richard Berg, um, the Pope, he, um, there, I made the Vassal module for it. And the funny mm-hmm. story was, I had just finished it. We'd went out of town for the weekend, seeing some in-laws. I was working like crazy. We come back and this tornado is heading right up Wichita toward Wichita state coming pretty much here. <laughs> and we're in the tornado shelter and I'm in there with my computer uploading it saying, if I die, I am not wasting 40 hours of work. My legacy will carry on through this vassal module. <laughs> but I customize a lot. I started putting customized cool stuff in there. So on the, the eliminated units box, when you open it, you can see the window where they're at. Right. It's a photograph I actually took at Saratoga of the monument where Frazier fell. Wow. So it, I thought it put a cool, you know, put a cool thing. Another one's like a photo of a bunch of cannons up on, um, um, uh, not Freeman's farm, the place where they were, their arm. I'm just totally blanking on the name right now where they dug in and they were waiting up there. Yeah. They're little, like uh, their little redoubt or whatever. Yeah. That they had. And I'm, and, um, yeah. Cause I remember when I was sitting up there, I'm like, Oh my goodness, I am here. I'm on the sacred ground. Um, yeah. So, I t- so there's photos in there. If you want to see it, just pop that open and look at the window and it's a photograph I took. I need to, I wanted to, you know, I've heard you talk about it so much and I knew you were up there and, you know, I was going to even jump on and just look at some, photos have they preserved that freeman's farm and all that really well yeah they did a pretty good job and they it shows you where everything's at and it was pretty cool to i was sitting there talking to the um i usually go to national parks or national park sites i always go in watch the movie even though i knew about the battle just to see what they're going to talk about go talk to park rangers see you know they'll give you the scoop but i was sitting there breaking it down in detail he goes man you really know this battle don't you i said yeah actually i learned it from a game he goes a game I'm, yeah board game <laughs> And I had a flip phone. I mean, this was 10 years ago, so I couldn't show them, get on BGG and show them the game. But it was pretty cool that it had been a, like five years since I had played the game, but I could still see the map clear as day from playing those like three games in a row. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could still see the map in my head. And it's pretty cool as I'm going down stuff like, yeah, I remember this part of the map. Sweet. <laughs> you know, the, the obviously the trees and stuff have been changed. You know, trees from 200 years ago are either ain't there or quite a bit different in appearance. <laughs> but um, they've done a pretty good job. You can still see the fields and things like that. And they'll tell you, yeah, here was here was the site of the place where they had set up their headquarters. That it's no longer there, but here's where it was at. Very cool. So, and when well, you sit up there, you can see why it was such a great defensible point. Hmm. So then, the the most recent or the newest game from GMT. I actually got lucky. I had Greg Smith, Gregory Smith, on a, a live show, and he sent me a couple games, one of which was The Hunted, which I haven't even been able to get out of the shrink yet because that's when everything kind of went wacky, and uh, my gaming time disappeared. Heck, everything disappeared. So my youngest son keeps asking me every day, work? You going to work? <laughs> no, I'm going to be home some days. So, But I got The Hunted, and... I'm hoping I almost mentioned it, but it it hasn't shown shipped yet. Imperial struggle, which is like the in time, it's like Twilight struggle, but it's that whole Spanish, French, English, uh, eighteen. Do you know when it starts? I forget the time. Uh huh. Yeah. I don't Same with that. Sorry. So, and what about you, sir? Um, oh, by the way, Tom just jogged my memory. Something Heights is the high area. Bemis Heights. Thank you, Tom. Hmm. Um. So yeah. Okay, my latest GMT I have ordered. It's not here, so I can't. I mean, the Men and Iron Tri Pack. It's Infidel Men and Iron and Blood and Roses, Richard Berg. Okay. But the one, and it's actually in transit. If I went and looked at my front porch, it's probably there now. That's the way these things tend to work. I pulled a trade with Board Game Co. If you're familiar with them on BGG, and got um, 
I ended up trading my um, Here I Stand because I've been told by people who really know it's not a good game to solo and it's a little too big. I don't have the time to dedicate or the group. So I traded it for the um, Command and Colors Medieval. Since I've been getting into the Men and Iron stuff lately, mm -hmm. um, kind of got interested. I thought, well, this might be a good way to learn about some of these battles. I've heard it's not as good as the others. I haven't really played a bad game, and the only one I've traded out of all of them was Battle Battle Lorks. I thought it was kind of absurd to have Asian Corps with elves and dwarves and spiders. Um, I would have rather had battles from Middle Earth. So <laughs> we'll see how it works. I thought figured if it doesn't work out that well, it ought to be easy to flip around and trade or put and pay it forward. But that it's in transit, so that's my latest. Now, see if I thought it was on the front porch, I would have to go take a peek. Well, it's probably not because the dog would go crazy, and he's going to go crazy here during this filming because driving instructors coming to pick up my daughter Got for it. a driver's ed thing and he's right. going to go nuts so right that's jordy more. that's jordy your is he a chihuahua jordy, my ferocious attack chihuahua <laughs> yeah that's right tom has actually met him and lived to tell about it so <laughs> <laughs> perfect perfect all right so that sets the stage with our first and our last and kind of how we got acquainted and where we're at why don't you kick us off with your number five why don't you okay. lead, the, lead the charge my number five is, I'm not going to do the thing like where you did the Borg, and you could put right. Great Battles of History. Right. QR. Um, I forget the year it came out. I got the reprint, um, and it was, uh, or the second edition, I guess it is, designed by, wait, oh, wait a minute, just for right. the moment. <laughs> for the moment. Oh. There. There. <laughs> there. By the Great One and the Pope. All the time I kept saying the Godfather because I remember it as a cool nickname. And he, Richard Berg always reminded me more of a Godfather than a Pope. But his nickname was the Pope of Wargaming. So in honor of Richard Berg, I got my Pope hat for this. Yeah. Um, you, you just have a Pope hat laying around. Believe it or not, I did. I used to take it to K-State games and Michael Bishop played. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had my staff. I and, yeah, it, it was. Um, anyway. <laughs> um Yes, designed by the Great One and the Pope. And it's a, the series started off not with this one. It was Alexander, first edition. Then it went through a – this is like the third version of it. And uh, Mark Herman actually created that. Then they ended up hooking, um, getting together and making this whole series. And I don't know how much of the original part was Mark's or how – I don't know who contributed what. He'd know that. But um, I've been getting so much into the Berg system, as I've been hearing it called, through um, Men of Iron stuff. I got the Wakefield game from C3I, the um, the the peg, uh, Sign of the Pagan, about Attila the Hun, Glory, the Civil War system. There's a lot of similarities in these games. And it's really cool. You get these like different groups. You might have hoplites, lights, light cavalry, and they're different formations. And you go and I activate one. And then they, if they're all within range of my leader, command range, I can move them, do my stuff. And then you go and activate a formation. Now, I could try to steal it from you, roll against my commander. And all these games have different. Sometimes you have cards, sometimes chip pulls. But it's a really cool system. And what's, I was going to explain this because I went years trying to figure this thing out. My Pope Hat's really not doing too well right now. <laughs> I loved it, man. The way it was sagging down a little bit. Yeah. Think, that's perfect. Right there. That's perfect. There we go. Yes, it's a cross between like a chef's hat and a pope's hat. There you go. Simple great battles of history. If you're wondering, I wonder, what is this about? Because you hear so much stuff about how it works. This isn't necessarily simple. It's simpler. And what it kind of does is it, it's pretty cool because it takes eight games. There's a lot of games in, in great battles of history. It takes like eight of them and gives a common rule book for all of them. Yeah. That is cool. Joel Toppin, he's a big proponent of this. He has videos on it. I think he said the best one to start with is Cataphract, which I don't have. But um, if you learn it and you're one of the you know the inch deep and a mile wide gamers and you're always moving around, you want to play as many games as possible, hey, learn one pretty easy rule book and you're off playing eight games. It takes four-hour scenarios and turns them into like an hour and a half because it removes a lot of the die rolling and stuff, I think, from routes. I've only played simple so far. Someday I was hoping that that convention at Dallas it ended up not happening for me because my kids had other priorities and I skipped it. The um, convention we had right before the COVID broke out, I was hoping I was going to get to play that with Mark Kerman and play the full version and see what it's all about. Hmm. Um, but um, yeah, the other the other's more detailed, but it's kind of like if you're 
If you wanted something a little bit more detailed than Command and Colors Ancients, this has a little bit more of that, you know, that chrome we like in war games. Right. And um, But that is a pretty cool system. And if you wonder what it's about, get on BGG, look up Simple Great Battles of History. It tells you the eight games it works with. The two I have obviously work with it, Alexander and SPQR. Now, I could have picked either one, so why did I pick SPQR? I find Roe more interesting than Alexander on a personal level because I've I'm a lot more familiar with the Punic Wars. But they are both really fun. Love this system. And it could be a rabbit hole if you really want to go down it. So that is my number five. And I have spoken. <laughs> I love it. Somebody you know what that there. references? Yes, that comes from The Mandalorian, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I love The Mandalorian. Matter of fact, I got a little Mando right up there. I don't know if you can see him. Cool. <laughs> He's sitting. He's sitting up there. He's joined my, he's right uh, right next to my dummies that are hanging out up there. Oh, I'm not going to find it now. Of course, everybody loved your hat, but I was looking. Uh, oh, I can't see it. Somebody had a great comment here. Well, there were several. There were several. We'll just move on. It was great. The comments came up. I was going to throw it up. All right. Um, I loved Skies Above the Reich. See if I can keep it without the glare on it. Now, they do have a sequel coming, um, I think, later this year. Storms Above the Reich introduces, this is BF-109s, the Messerschmitt 109 against B-17s. Uh, Storms uh, Storm Above the Reich will bring in um, Stoffels of F-190s, FW-190s, and it will be the B-24. And Of course, you can combine them, separate them, do whatever you want. Let me move that over here. And I'm oh, sorry. Nope. What this really does is it brings in the board is this. It looks really weird at first when you bring it out because you're kind of like, what's going on here? What they've modeled is that 3D bomber box that these 109s in particular here had to crack. And so not only is it your approach and then your firing and, and all that, but it's your exit out of the box. And then how does that bring you back around? Are you coming back around? And if you're coming back around, do you spend time to get back around to come in at 12 or 1.30? Or are you going to zip back around and try to come up from 6 o'clock? Um, and it just does a phenomenal job of creating this battle space, which... I'd never seen done. Of course, I've played hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of games from the B-17 side of it with B-17 Queen of the Skies. But the idea of how do you get at these bombers, I had read, and I'm going to blank on it now. Um, it was a book. Shoot. I'm, if somebody may know it. Um, it was um, Charlie Brown was a pilot of a B-17 that was attacked by a uh, – uh, 109, and when he realized, the German pilot realized he was basically his tail gunner was dead and everything. It was early in the war. He escorts him back uh, kind of out of German airspace and then blanking on the name. But um, the book is written from, see if anybody threw it in. The book is written from the German fighter's perspective. And in that book, he covers the first time he flies at a bunch of B-17s in their bomber box defensive formation. And it was so great having read that to then play that tough nut to crack the bomber box and how they cross supported each other. And that is what skies above the Reich brings you. You're trying to keep your Stoffel, your flight alive. It's not one fighter that you're running. It's a a group, a stoffel of fighters that you're trying to keep up and running. But it does a real good job of, of mimicking your combat space. So, in the name of A Higher Call, A Higher Call is the name of the book, and it is awesome. Awesome book. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Number, that is my number five, Skies Above the Reich. I wanted to mention a couple more things about this. You always have it run in the back of your mind, and you had that blank look. Well, I, I think you're, break, you're breaking you're break a rule. I'm breaking a rule. I'm going back. <laughs> if go ahead. Break I, it. Man. This is kind it. of a cool story. This game, shoot, when I first started playing Ancients back in like 2011, and I I knew who Mark Herman was only because of We the People. And I checked. It's like, well, that's kind of cool. That guy that made that made this, blah, blah, blah. I'd like to get this. And I went to GMT's P500 and it had like 100. 
And I was like, well, that'll be a while. And I watched through the years and it just crawled. And mm. it was, I think, a year or two ago. I Back when I was on Twitter, actually, I went to GMT just to curiosity to look it up. And it was a 497. I said, holy cow, boom, I'm 498. I jump on Twitter and I said, hey, people, this game's a 498. Two of you get on here. Bam. I mean, within an hour, it's back up to 500. GMT put this thing right on and got there. So I like to pat myself on the back to get this thing made. <laughs> um, but now, the, if you're wondering, there was three versions of this the second and this they look identical if you're curious what hmm. this amounts to i think there's something with the glossiness or the coating on the counters i mean they didn't and they might have touched a rule or two maybe on just cleaning it up a little it wasn't like big a rat or anything because the game's been out for so long but they're c3i um oh modules extra battles and they put them in here and if you have the great battles the simple great battles it has a sheet for those eight games or whatever that tells you there's like little variances on how to convert your game to simple great battles on how the command structure works. This one already has them in there saying, hey, if you play regular, it's this. If you have simple, it's this. So but I mean, if you have this, if you can find the second version for a trade or something, boom, you're not really missing much. You might have to go out and trade for some three C three I modules if you want them. But that's really it. What a huge difference. The first one had a whole lot less um, stuff in it. but I think it's still the same core game. It's just Mark Herman only made that. So, sorry, I meant to bring that up. Okay, my number four, Fighting Formations, Chad Jensen. Yes. Um, I've heard this called Combat Commander with Tanks. I don't see it. Hmm. Um, I'm not a great expert on Combat Commander. I have played it. This doesn't use cards. I mean, it does have cards, but they're assets. You may use them. You may never use them. Um, I've, I've had this on a game or two on past shows. It uses this really bizarre, almost Europhily command structure on, um, like, it's, oh, how do you call it? Like, momentum almost type of thing. Of I might, it, it swings back and forth, and as you spend action, it's like a it's like a meter, the, a push-pull meter, and it might be three in my favor. The, the, and if I spend a command to do this, it uses up two of those points and pushes it two, and then I do another one that pushes it two, and now it's one in your favor. Now it goes to you for your command action. Mm. And then there's various different command actions you can do based upon a random, I don't know if you remember, it's like a die roll or something. So you might only have two possible play a card possibilities for this turn or so many movements or so many. And it uses a bunch of different dice like D20s, D, D6s, D10s, D12s because of different stuff. You know, they um, like the heavy stuff may use D20s and the light guys are using D6s. It kind of reminds me of that. Ameritrash football game uses multiple dice, a uh, battle something. But anyways, uh, it is a it it's weird because the command structure is so abstracted. It feels like a euro, but it's really it's kind of Mark Wallace thing. It's fun. Mm -hmm. It's not your hardcore sim. It's at the platoon level instead of the uh, the squad level, like combat commander. And um, but yeah, it's not using the cards where you don't have to worry about. I don't have a fire card. I can't fire type of thing. That I know comes you don't like that. that. Yeah, I mean, but hey, I got combat commander, so I sure. seem to have got over that. Um, but anyways, that was always my favorite, and I had heard before about how great Chad Jensen was at making rule books. I, you know, when you'd have these discussions, I'd usually hear him and Gorunki put it right there at the top. We actually had a mm -hmm. poll over on the. Um, game box and those two came one Volco ended up winning on that one I think people were a little more favorable you know? but they were one too it's like you always hear those guys mentioned for great rule books well he and, talked about uh, his wife Kai would would read over and kind of edit his rule books too okay cool um so. yeah when I got this it's a brilliant rule book because like holy cow this thing's easy you read it it's easy I mean rule books are usually good at teaching or good at referencing but not both this one is Hmm. It's really if you just can't use usually you didn't understand it. It's just you forgot the detail. So you go back and look at it like, oh, this it's just so easy to understand. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, it fits right. And I've heard that about Combat Commander. See, Greg taught me. So I've never actually read the Combat Commander rule book. But um, anyway, so that is my number four. I have spoken. So Trevor's wondering, are you talking about pizza box football or blood bowl? I don't think it's called Blood Bowl. I Pizza Box Battle. uses a red or a yellow or yellow dice, green dice, red dice, I think. But it all depends on – I can't remember. I've got it sitting over there. I it's like, like robots playing football when you're trying to move the ball and you're trying to destroy other robots. I, I think, think that's like Battle Ball. 
Could be. Uh, that is the other not, room. That's why I can't just look over and see it. Um, yeah, pizza box football is different, but it uses dice uh, based on whether or not you whether or not you pick their play or something. I can't remember. I yeah, the other game is like if you're receiving, you roll a D20, so you're more likely to roll that, you know, 15, where if you're a big lineman, you're, moving, you're rolling D6. But it doesn't mean your receiver is not going to roll a one. So weird game. If you, if you played, you'll know immediately what I'm talking about. So you hit it perfectly. My number four, boom, combat commander. All right. The whole series, really, but Europe. Um, Chad Jensen, of course. This is that squad level card based combat. I call it fog of command. So I love this, the, the platoon or even down to man level, but platoon or squad, sorry, squad level is, I love that. Um, I had also played this once with Greg, and I was like, eh, and I didn't really clinch in, cinch in one minute. I, I didn't get it. And then I was talking to GMT. They were doing the fourth printing, and I'm like, I've got to be missing something here. Um, and I said, hey, uh, you don't need another review of this, but I, I'm missing something. They said, boom, we'll send it to you. And I played it, and it clicked in, and that's where I coined it and – like I said, maybe I'm nuts, but I called it that the, it felt like in the fog of command. So think fog of war, but that fog of command, when I was, I was in a light infantry unit, I was a medic and only during peacetime, but I experienced, um, you know, we got orders to, we were supposed to do a diversionary technique and hit a fixed position. Um, we Worked out exactly where it was on the map. I knew we had to break, you know, 400 meters that way and then break north another 300 meters. And that should bring us right up on the flank of this, this fixed position. And the sergeant I was with was lost and confused. And it was driving me crazy. This is, we're talking like 1993. And I'm like, dude, all we got to do is go there and there. And he would not move. He wouldn't initiate. And that is what this makes me feel like, and I, you know what you want to do, you know where you want to do it, but you can't get it pulled off. Now it was frustrating in real life and it can be frustrating here, but I could see that design element and how it really worked in real life. Um, um, you know, I was a specialist, which is an E4 and, uh, I could have gotten in trouble, but I was like, I kept telling him where we needed to go. And I finally grabbed four guys and we went. And then he started running after us. Uh, that that wouldn't go too well. Thank goodness it was a reserve unit. That would not go well active duty. But uh, uh, yeah, it was just crazy. I was like, what are you doing, man? And it was a timed hit. We had to hit it at a certain time in order to be a distraction. So it drew forces to one side while the main body hit another side. You could not dither here. And he dithered. And it was driving me crazy. Who would have thought I could have got dithered in three times? There you go. Oh. So that is what I get from this, um, and and I totally then understood, at least in my mind, what it was doing as a game element. Because when you do play squad level stuff or or even platoon level stuff, um, tactical warfare, you have a lot of perfect information which you do not have in the real world, and that is how this handles that and keeps it entertaining and fun and light. Quite honestly, I wouldn't say it's like a heavy, a heavy thing. It's more of that lighter feel to it. You know, the my, my joke on that, I think I've said this a couple of times, is Greg taught that to me and I beat him. And my joke is if I beat Greg at a game, the first time I played, it's got to be broken because Greg's too smart. <laughs> now, I lucked out against him and we the people. I mean, he had me clobbered and I got lucky. But otherwise, if he plays me a game and I beat him, he, he even gave me a puzzle look when I told him this. that If I beat him, I don't like the game. And I said, it's got to be broken. You're too smart, dude. <laughs> you know, if I played that uh, Twilight Struggle, it would be a cakewalk, you know. <laughs> We'd be betting money on how many cards it would take him to beat me. Um, but um, anyway, the uh, – Now, real quick, I, I like Vorpal. Vorpal Bite says um, he does not admit to being dithered. It sounds <laughs> obscene. Sorry, go ahead. I had to throw that Yeah, no, the, um, I think when we played – because anytime you introduce cards into a game, you're going to get outliers. And I think we had an outlier game, and it wasn't. I just all I could see was the weakness of the game, and I just discounted it. And then through the years, especially after you start talking about it, one of our early ones, or I mean, earlier, like I think it was last year, earlier this year, that was right before COVID broke out. And we were at your house, and you had it in there. I think it's your most expensive one. 
I got to thinking more about that. And then I went out and traded for it. Cause I think, you know, I think the way to really judge it is I need to get at least 10 games under my belt, which mm -hmm. I've, somebody told me that about, um, race for the galaxy. My wife and I gave it 10 plays and said, this game sucks. We even figured out the, <laughs> we even figured out the icons and said, this game just, bleh. yeah, but, the icons are where I fall short. And that, yeah, game. we figured them out. We still said it sucked. So I was <laughs> like, okay, don't, don't at me, man, because we, we gave it the shot. It ain't there. Um, but, um, Anyways, that one, I thought, yeah, I can see why. Because people keep going on and all these crazy stories about my one guy that took out three machine gun nests. Like, it ain't trying to go for uber realism. I got Band of Brothers for this. And if it's just fun, I just want to have some fun. Hey, go for it. I mean, I play Ameritrash all the time. You think football robots blowing each other up is realistic? <laughs> so um, but I thought, yeah, so I've, I've got that thanks to you. Thank you. Now, I will say, Lucky13, he says, I can see a person who likes B-17 liking that game. That seems like an interesting comment, but I'll just say you're correct. I love B-17 and the stories it tells, and Combat Commander tells stories as well. So I will I will agree with you on that point. So, okay, my number three Do it. is... This will shock people who know me because it's only been a very recent infatuation. Command and Colors Napoleonics. Ooh. Which I have always said was my least favorite Command and Colors game. And the yeah. reason why was I wasn't in Napoleon that and much. Same, same here. He's a short dead dude that rides water slides in San Dimas. Not um, really that short. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know the reference I'm making. I do. I okay. Do. Um, Bill and yeah. Ted, baby. And this is crazy. War gamers, I always laugh privately. I don't get on the boards and mock them, but I laugh at the guys who fear of missing out. I got to get it, got to get it, got to get it. I'm like, dude, if it's that big, it'll be second edition. Um, blah, blah. But Rob introduced me to this. My buddy who taught me Ancients, he taught me that. And I thought, that's pretty cool. You know, the things you liked about it, combine arms. The, the unique things about it is combine arms um, and squares. They do a really good job with how they handle infantry squares. Excellent. And the big one in it's dice reduction. People gripe about it. doesn't matter if I have one soldier or four soldiers in memoir. I always roll the same, same number of dice. Right. This one uses dice reduction. If you ask me, it's a little too harsh. Tricorn gets it just right. Okay. Um, but it does have that because you don't want to attack with that one guy because I only get one die. My chance of getting that hit are pretty slim. Sure. I'd really, really not waste one of my two commanded guys on him. Um, but, um, yeah, I got this and it was kind of fun. And then I did a serious double down on this game and said, I am sure I'm going to love this game. And this was, <laughs> I think I got this in 2015. I got all four of the army expansions, Prussia, Austria, Russia, and Spanish. Nice. I did not get the epics or the tactics guys at the time. Last year, during their fall sale, I rarely qualify for their fall sales, but I got it, and I jumped on tactics, passed up epics, and and uh, just last night, I bought epics. So, yeah, I'm completed. And, but what epic, really did, epics pushes the map deeper. Okay. I figured it was the double overlord type of system or something they were going to do with it. I, I believe but, it's more in depth, but I don't have it. So, but yeah. I think it's more about the depth of it rather than the breadth, which is more what the epic is. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, what really did it was during the whole COVID time when I was just kind of bumming and not really in a game mood, I thought I need to, I just need to kick, kickstart myself, get, get myself going on this. So I pulled out the Napoleonic 20 series. Cause if you learn one game, I had like seven in the series. Fading Glory has like four in it. And I had a few from Victory Point games. If I learned this system, I can play all these games. Then as I started playing them, I wanted to get on YouTube and start learning the history of it. Then I see the whole what was going on in Spain. Then I start watching more videos on what happened in Spain. Then I start watching what goes on over, I think it's Baradino, Greg calls it. So I don't know if it's Bordino or Baradino, but anyways, the uh, I started learning all about what he did in Russia. And I was like, this is really interesting. So then I set on this really aggressive campaign. I've got a geek list going. I figure it's going to take over a year. I am playing all of the Napoleonic scenarios in chronological order when they occurred. So wow. I start, the first one is Austria. 1805 is the first scenario. At least I went through all my stuff and looked it up. And um, so I played through the first batch of Austria ones, and now I'm into Prussia. I, played, I think I just played Yenna. And um, so it's going to take me a little bit to get to Spain and Russia to find those out. 
But that has just been a now I'm really into Napoleonic history. I have right set up now Mark Herman's Waterloo game. And I got um, in one of those C3Is I got sent the Frederick Bray, Frederick, Frederick Bay. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the French version, but it's Days of Glory System, Battle of Issy. Um, and I'm just really getting this Napoleonic stuff. And I have just been going crazy for CNC Napoleonics lately. And it's just like, wow, because I've just been so mean to it for all this time, but I never would part with it because I thought those armies are going to be a great way to learn history if I ever actually jump into learning it. True. And it finally happened. And now as I play these scenarios through, I'm getting get the background on before I play them. Love it. So that is my number three, Command and Colors Napoleonics. I have spoken. <laughs> <laughs> My Hi. number three, GMT, Boom. Pacific, Pacific Typhoon. Yes. Yeah. So this, yeah. Is, so this is based is off of the, the – let me pause a little bit. I'm getting a reverb. Okay. Now it's caught up. Good. Okay. Sometimes it's got to catch up a little bit if I pause. All right. This is based off of the Atlantic Storm game. So this is – Three to seven players, although over at our house, my house back in the day, we used to do Friday gaming, and uh, Greg would be here, bring Atlantic Storm. I'd picked up ty uh, Pacific Typhoon. We've even had it up to eight, and it worked fine, if I remember right. It's a little longer with that many, but but uh, it worked fine. So what this does is it's um, your... So you've got your air cards, your surface cards, your sub cards, and then you have certain battles that you're fighting over. And it's trick-taking feel because you're not always uh, the allies or the Japanese. It's whichever side you want to jump in on to win that battle. And then it's how many of those tricks basically can you take. And it just, um, I like Atlantic Storm better i do like it better i think it works a little bit better but atlantic storm uses the convoys and the subs trying to take the convoys out and and it and it feels like it runs a little tighter uh, but this is is also very very fun very very pleasant um the weird thing you got to get used to of course is um i think there's Oh, I can't remember. Is it 20? I don't think I have it in my notes. Um, you're shuffling the cards up and then you're fighting over, I want to say it's 20 different battles. I could be wrong with that exact number. Mm -hmm. But you have the historical battle events just come up randomly. So, so you got to know that it's not like you're running in chronological order. But it is a fabulous war game themed trick-taking game. And it handles such a big group now that can be part of the downfall other than when I had these Friday night or Friday day games, I had Friday, Saturday or Wednesday, Thursday, Fridays off. And uh, I started having folks over and we started getting these huge numbers on Fridays and we just started playing the heck out of this in Atlantic storm. Um, otherwise it's a little hard to get this game rolling or Atlantic storm rolling unless in my opinion, you're at a con, but uh, Greg would play that a lot down at the um, game store back when it yes. was open. I'd see a game games of that going. Sorry, 20 rounds. It's it's 20 rounds. Um, yep. Suit time of day is what you're the yep. And it's trick taking. So yeah, it it works really nice. It's it's a fun because different people are jumping in, whether you're gonna be allied or Japanese, and then you're it's what you can what trick you can take, and then whoever takes the trick splits them with the other folks that jumped in and assisted with whatever side you backed. So fun game, but it does take a group. I, I don't think I'd want to play it with three. Probably yeah, four. I, yeah, big numbers was great. So, you know, I'd always heard Atlantic Storm was better, and I wondered how you'd pull it off because I can't name 20 battles in the Atlantic in World War II. And then when you said convoys, I'm like, ah, there you go. Right. Yeah, it was all okay. about the different convoys heading out. And, yeah, that's what um, it was. Yeah, when I got that game, because I saw somebody's comment about South Pacific, I got that game because I was, eh, I was maybe a year or two into BGG. I hadn't felt and got my feel for how, how all these games and game companies work. I was looking for a game called Scratch One Flat Top. I, 
I, don't, mm. I think it was GDW. May, it might have made it. You can look it up on BGG. Mm. And it has that exact same picture on there. Yes, it does. I've seen so when it. When I'm at the store and I see it, I go, oh, there's that game I want. I don't remember that name, but I remember that picture. Throw it in. Get back to the hotel room. It was like three to seven players. I don't remember this. <laughs> and I played it at our Tornado Alley game day, Greg, and we could always get a game going. And loved it. I ended up trading my copy. I still have decks to drink because that was all, when we played it. We always had Greg's copy. Uh, wait a minute, Bart, you just went. Okay, there you went. You just you're, disappeared on me for a second. Yeah, you digitized a little bit, but you're back. It's the Matrix, man. Um, but um, anyway, yeah, the we always played Greg's copy, so I didn't really need my copy around looking cool on my shelf. I call them shelf trophies. So I ended up trading my copy. But it's funny, I learned later on, yeah, Roger McGill who uses artwork from time to time. So he's used that on Pacific Typhoon, South Pacific, and um, um, that Scratch One flat top. But it's a very cool picture. So Oh, it's a great picture. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, it does not solo well. That was a question. Is that solitary? No, it is not. Lucky 13 said no, plays well, but plays well solo. I've never even Oh, they're played. talking about Band of Brothers. Oh, sorry. I missed that in the uh, topics then. Sorry, yep. I'll stay off those comments. Um, no, it's it's a blast as a group trick-taking game. So, See, Perfect. I can mention that game even though it's in the Hall of Fame. It just means I'm not – it's not Voldemort, and I won't ever say the name. <laughs> Washington's more uh, – it's just I won't put it on my list. Ambush, it's ambush, ambush. The Hall of Fame. I will still speak of it because it's fabulous, and there's a reason why. <laughs> okay, they just so won't to, make our list. They just won't make our list. Are we up to two? Yes, sir. I mean, okay, my number two, brace yourself. This is going to come as a shocker. Brace, brace. Empire of the Sun. <laughs> Most people probably never heard me ever talk about this game. It's made by, never. what's that guy's name? Um, his epicness. <laughs> no, his epicness. That's right, Mark Herman. Um <laughs> Um, I've talked about that game so much. It probably should be in the hall of fame. Um, it's, it's pretty heavy. There's a lot of support for it. You can see all the other videos where I talked about it. Card driven game. It takes it to the highest level, um, of, wow, this is what you can do with card driven games. Um, mm -hmm. hex driven covers all the world War two Pacific. It makes so much sense out of it. If you want to learn about why they did stuff, why the Island hopping strategy, why, why did Japan do what they did? It, this game makes sense of all of it. Great teaching tool. Uh, been three editions. Um, the second, I think, was more of just a straight reprint. I think they redid the rules and made me did, did something small with the supply rules. Oh, upgraded the counters. It made it a lot easier to track who, when you have these Army-Navy disagreements, which if you saw the awesome Midway movie that came out last sure, year. Sure. I saw like five times or something. need to get it on DVD. Um, they had the Army-Navy disagreement, and that's so cool. Um, but it helps you keep track of which unit's okay. I'm under restriction, so I can't activate. The third edition, I don't know. I have the second edition, by the way. <laughs> signed. Um, by the way, um, Uva, Uva Beck can't believe this is your number two. Okay. There's, there's some debate on there. What might be your number one? Just so you know, you've oh, Tom. Um, yeah. I just will be quiet, but I was ah. gonna say, some, somebody out there will probably figure it out just because he's been playing with me so much. Ah. Um, ah. But um, anyway, they, um, I was going to say, oh, the third edition, there was a C3I that rolled, that had a, a miniature version of this game called South Pacific. And I keep telling people that's the way to learn the game. Right. Um, now, if you're if you're like my friend Grog Bill and you really have no problems figuring out the most complex war games, jump, go right it for. But if you just need a little bit more easy to manage, shorter game, and it it covers it all. There's little scenarios, but they leave out parts of the game on purpose. But South Pacific really does a great job fighting over a small piece of map. Lets you work on the core mechanics. And the third edition, it was rolled into it. Because it's, it's Empire of the Sun, you only use this part of the map. I don't know if they threw in the special map or not. Only use these cards, only use these counters. And it's a great way to learn. It was rolled into the third edition. So um, if you're interested on first, second, or third, second and third have the new counters, which are a big, big boom. Hmm. Um, my old Vassal tutorials, I made 24 of them teaching you different segments of the game. Um, I have the old counters. People have asked me, are you ever going to upgrade? Dude, that was a ton of work. Um, so 
I haven't had the stomach to do it, but there are tons of ways to learn this game. But it is my favorite Pacific game. It's not my favorite Mark Herman game, but I think it's his most awesome work because it just blows my mind more than his others. My favorite is Washington's War. Uh, I'm going to say that word. Um, but it can't be my number one because it's in the Hall of Fame. Right. That is my number two, Empire of the Sun. I have spoken. Oh, very, nice. very nice. So my so number, my two, number two, two, I'm going to pause. Trying to let the sound catch up. I think we're there. Reiner Knizia and Battle Line. Reiner I was wondering if you put that in there. It's definitely eligible. Yes. My favorite designer is Reiner Knizia. I love his games. I've reworked my shelf over here so that I could bring Knizia's games, much like Martin Wallace, who I like as well, onto his own shelf. So I have my Knizia games. The problem is I have my GMT shelf and I have my Knizia shelf. This is now going to migrate over to my Kinesia shelf because um, I really, really enjoy this game. It's the light nature of it. I've played this with my spouse. It is something that I can do even after a long shift and I come home and I can't quite, you know, I don't want to go down and dive into something super heavy, but I can sit down with my wife and just play over, hey, can we get, who can get five of the nine they're like pawns, but they call them flags or who can get three in a row. And you're just playing three cards down for their color, or it's like poker with three cards. So that's the best way to describe it. You know, three of a kind, you're going for a royal flush. Yeah. And then you have tactic cards. Is that what they're called? I couldn't remember. Are they called? Yeah, I think they are. Yeah. Tactic mud, cards. mud and stuff like that. You got to yeah. go four deep now instead of three deep and, yeah, and this Wild was card, the, steal a card. The original game was Shot and Totten, which I've never had, and uh, and then it came out from GMT in this version, and it's it is very light, but Kinesia does beautiful, beautiful things with simple, small, it, what almost seems easy, and then it kind of shows you the depth as you play it, and so it's light, it's still light, but then there's there's these little these little depth points in there. And that's what Kenichi is great at. And this could almost be my favorite, but I haven't gone back and played it in a while. So it's number two, because I debated between this, which I've definitely got a lot of plays on, and what may be my number one, which may be more of a cult of the new thing, maybe. Okay. Sorry. That was in my top five euros. Um yeah, and Kabuki Kid says strategy, not, strategy games. Yeah, um, Kabuki Kid says not historical, of course. Yeah, it's not. It's 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 just a beautiful card game. Oh, before I forget, Vorpal Bite had a comment about Starfleet Battles. That game's called Federation and Empire, by the way, just in case you go looking on BGG and can't find it. Um, yeah, Bart, I don't know if you remember this or not. Back, oh, this is right after I joined our gaming group downtown, okay. back when we were in Delano. And um, I, I had put a comment because my wife and I was playing a lot of two player Euros. I we remember the ride and um, uh, San Juan. And I had asked for a good two player Euro game. Mm -hmm. And people were blah, 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 blah. Anyways, you popped in and said, I'll just bring you, I'll bring you a couple. And one was like a balloon race game. Yep. That's balloon cup. Yeah. And that didn't do much for us. She said, well, try this one out. And right before I brought it back, I thought, well, I probably owe it to you to try this out. Could you loan it to him? And we tried it out. And we said, holy cow, this game's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so then yeah. I ran out and bought it. So there you go. You, you're a bad influence. <laughs> Definitely. Bloom Cup's awesome, by the way, too. But if you didn't like it, you didn't like it. So Yeah, but that one is I, – I tell people, I said, you know, imagine taking playing poker without money and they kind of eh. – I'm like, yeah, this is actually moneyless poker and it's fun. Right. So. Yeah, it's the idea that if you can capture three of the flags or pawns that are in a row, you're going to win, mm -hmm. or any five of the nine, and then you're you're pitched battle across from each other with your cards, but you're only laying that one in, and so that's what's so cool. All righty, honorable mention time. Um, if you've got them, I did not have any honor honorable mentions. I know you do. How many do you have? I generally do five. What? Oh my God, that's thievery. That that should I, well, should, I only tell their names. I should um, outlaw you. Do it. Do it. Uh, you'll take okay. all. Five. I'm not throwing um, any. 
Now, the thing I always say, these are snapshots in time. So you'll see games and say, huh, I thought that would have been your top five comeback. Next week, it may be. My top two are probably locked in forever. Everything else is negotiable. <laughs> so when I make my top 100 list in December and go, wait a minute, you had this higher on your GMT list. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on the day. Like I said, lately I've been in a polyonics and the Richard Berg thing going on. So those mm-hmm. two kind of, you know, cult of the new issue of sorts as to what my latest group has been. These are not an in- they're not in alphabetic order. They're just in order of sturdiness of the box. Because if I put the top <laughs> game in the bottom, it'll crush under the weight. So here they are. Fading Glory. I mentioned it. It's the game that really got me started back in Napoleonics. Uh, for the people, which probably most days would be in my top five. I struggled on... I mean, this is this is a great game. It's not the first coin game. I don't know where people come up. It's not coin at all. But it's political. But Labyrinth, Vocal Runky, um, Killer Rulebook, best one of the best players I ever saw, too. Pass of Glory, Ted Racer, and Vocal again, Wilderness War. I think that's probably about the best game on the French Navy War. And there goes the dog going crazy. There you go. There's Jordy. Jordy, about to rip somebody's arm off. <laughs> okay. Um, Lead us in. So, number one. Number one. My number one. Drum roll, brace yourself. Command of Colors Ancients, which as of this week, thanks to Tom, is now my number one most played war game ever. It passed um, really? Memoir. Wow. I got my 91st game of it in. Um, memoir was at 90. My friend Rob, I told him that, and he chuckled and said he had like 398 plays of this and Ooh. 370 of Memoir. Rob's the one that introduced me to it. I thought I'd teach it to him as a way of learning Vassal so I could suck him into other games. Instead, he did a um, Uno reverse on me and hooked me on this topic, this system, this game. I have all the expansions. Tom and I play this thing live every week. Um, he's clobbered me so bad. I about <laughs> I jumped and said, he, he, beat me. he put such a vicious beating on me, it almost fell to number two this week. I mean, he put a slap it on me. I lost Brutus and Cassius. He beat me eight to three. We were playing the Battle, battle of Philippi. Wow. And so he just crushed me vicious. So Tom, Tom, you about ruined the game for me now. But uh, yeah, we play this about every week. And then I play Rob Ongoing and Vassal. We've been playing since 2011. And the game is just, I learned so much about tactics. I would do stuff. And then Rob would tell me, yeah, this was the blah, blah, blah that they would actually do. Or like, you know, they they didn't have stirrups. So that part of explains why you can't do certain things with cav- cavalry. Nice. <laughs> Good pronunciation. Um, but yeah, screenings. I, I've used my light units to screen. You know, you stick them in there, you're afraid to get hit on your flank. They hit you, you, you do a fallback really quick so you can't get a lot of beating, but it protects your side. Uh, you hit the sides like Hannibal used to do. He did the flanks with his cavalry. And then they try to hit you back with their infantry and you just pop back out and they can't hardly do anything to you. You just keep hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting just like that. Um, yeah, I thought, um, joke, I got this knack for getting Julius Caesar killed. Rob and I have been playing Caesar stuff and I've lost him every time I've played him. <laughs> I changed history. I've also got Hannibal killed, so I'm the great history changer. <laughs> but um, but just so much cool stuff in a fairly – it's not a simple game. I tell people this is not a beginner game. Memoir is. This, when Rob taught this to me, we were playing uh, – pen, not Pendergrass, something like that. Big open plane battle. I'm real close to it. Um, and I, I was supposed to win easily, and I got clobbered because I wasn't understanding battle backs and leaders and support and all this stuff. It's a lot heavier than people give it credit for. It's kind of like a 24-page rule book. I and, agree. Yeah. Who can evade? Well, let's see. Lights can always evade. Your cavalry can evade against any infantry, but they, they can only do it, evade against heavier cavalry. Light can do it against anybody. Medium can only do it against heavy. So there's a lot to keep in your mind. Elephants, chariots, but um, the system works so well. And then you got the five expansions covering the, you know, the Gauls, the um, Eastern battles, the Spartans. And it's just a really nice system. It's not too heavy. It's not, you know, great battles of history is a lot more sim, but this does a pretty nice job for what it does. And that's why I have both games because they, they, they let me scratch a different itch. But this thing, like I said, you played this, this much, how could it not be my number one? Actually my asterisk number one, because everybody knows Washington War would be my number one. If it could, it weren't the hall of fame. It cannot. So anyways, so that's mine. Last year, it, it jumped Empire on my top 100. I was just like, man, how can I keep this game down? I just continually play it all the time, and I just can't get enough. I play it solo. I play it opposed. You name yeah, it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of depth to it, actually. I mean, I, I've also got the uh, 
the first edition of the the medieval, which is like the next step in, because uh, it's the the uh, first. There's going to be three games on the medieval side, and um, I mean they're the. I think they do a great job of really showing what that history is. Yeah. And shoot, I stumbled onto it. Tom and I was playing and I was like, oh, that's why the elephants are so nasty. <laughs> you know, once I could break a hole and get them back, cause just wrecking havoc everywhere. But you also see how you deploy your skirmishers against your elephants. And yeah. so it does a good job of getting some con, you know, it's not, it's not, if you want that much detail, first of all, read a book. And like Mark Kremen always points out, we have so little, I got a kick out of one of his things. He said, he actually printed, he says, this is all we know about the battle of marathon. It was like two paragraphs. So people say, well, that's just not realistic. How do you know? Is that a time <laughs> machine? Um, but we don't know a lot. And um, so, but what, what we do know, you know, it, it does a good job with what it's trying to do. So anyway, that is my number one. I have spoken. Very nice. My number one. That's my new catchphrase. <laughs> it's, a, it's a perfect catchphrase. It is the my, way. <laughs> my number one is definitely uh, Cult of the New. But I'm going to go with Tank Duel. Wow, I thought he's going to have coin in there. Nope, Enemy in the Crosshairs. It it plays back to what all what may even be said. If if I like B17, I definitely like this. I feel like this is a bit of B17 in a tank. Um, there's a lot more coming as well. They're doing uh, they're getting ready to come out with another tank pack, and then they're doing one that's in uh, in North Africa as well. Um, what? Uh, Really, what I liked about it is exactly kind of what was hinted at with uh, my other games that were mentioned with the B-17 was that it tells a narrative story. And I've found that with a lot of the war games that I gravitate to, I like a game that unfolds and tells a narrative story. And the card use in here on how you're flipping the card and saying, I want to do that, and this is how I'm going to do that. And then you're flipping the card to see if you've actually been able to pull whatever that is off. Um, it is based on, um, well, it's not based on the idea of the, the computer game. I think it's war of tanks. I've never played it. Uh, but the designers wanted to create that in a board game. Uh, the whole idea is that it's fast, it's fast action turns. And then using the, uh, command cards or the battle cards, uh, on the resolution of whatever your commands are is what's going on, but it's, it, for me, it easily falls back on it's that narrative story where in my mind's eye, I can see that theater of the mind. I can see the tank that's stuck in the mud or that's thrown a track and then, you know, what's going on and then support's coming up or whatever's going on. And that part I find, I find enjoyable. So, and that's why it's up there. And the fact that I'm, it's got me excited about the extra stuff that's coming. It was clearly built for that. I'm not naive. Had this not worked, I'm sure it would have just stopped at this one iteration, but it worked well. And it's definitely set up to spin out iterations. Some people will hate that. I personally will look forward to that. Who designed that? Uh, I've got even like, I can't say his name. It's this B. Berta, Berta Selly. Yeah. Mike. Berticelli and I thought there was someone else. Oh, the graphics are by Terry Leeds. So lots of different tanks and the tank packs that are coming again. I mean, it kind of fits. The components are great. Uh, GMT having it. It's awesome. Um, and you know, it's, I just find it that theater of the mind fun. Okay. Um, Trevor had asked a question I was going to show the answer to. If, if, you had, if you're going to have any more on this, go ahead. Do it. No, go. Okay. Trevor asked how I store them. I'm a, remember, I'm a control for, I'm a, I'm a control for, I'm trying to see if I can get this to where it was. Like, let's see if I can. Organization. Remember when Mike Cornell was doing this and this? That's how I am every week trying to find. Um, oh, oh, uh, where to go, where to go? Hold on, hold on. I'm bringing you up. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm trying to make it new. Back to you, dude. There. I know. Hold on. Okay, see, it says car heavy calf times 12. I have individual baggies for each one. I got pieces of paper. <laughs> My original game has the brown blocks with Romans and um, I think, yeah, uh, no, sorry, brown's Carthage. 
the Gray Romans. Um, the first expansion introduced the Eastern Theater, the Yellow Blocks, and then in later editions, you'd see Yellow Blocks, maybe like the Sparta one especially. I would take those Yellow Blocks, put them all in expansion one. So that way, if I ever need them, I know I don't have to go digging through multiple boxes. Um, so I tried to organize it that way. So it's easy to set Mark. stuff up. That So yeah. I don't know if that helps or not. Uh, I think I had to put all my cards in. I mean, this thing is so jam packed. Um, I think I had to put my cards in the epics box because the epics box is pretty sparse. But um, my Napoleonics, I have a different system. I think I put like all infantry in. I put the regulars in one, all other infantry in another bag, all cavalry in a separate bag, all um, great pronunciation artillery, yeah, and like all leaders. But I didn't have to go through as much detail as this one because. That was just a little easier to sort. This one, the blocks are too similar. There's too many different types of green block. I mean, sorry, green units. Yeah, the lights. Um, so right now, I'm in extreme, extreme geek mode. But yeah, I'm a, I'm really, really bad OCD almost on how I organize my games. Yes, you but do get there. If the question time. was how do I take the various blocks when they put yellow blocks in multiple games, I put them all in the same. Same with Napoleonics. All British are in like the original game with the French, all Spanish are in one, you know, that that way I keep them all. It's a lot easier to deal with that way. And all the French from the various games are in the same box. That's it makes it a lot easier to set up a scenario and go for it. And then Tom and then said Tom that he thinks Terry, Terry leads the, the artwork here are the illustrations. Okay. Also does the artwork for Imperial Struggle, which is that gorgeous map. Well, there you go. There's our first publishers addition of our top five anything else you want to throw in nothing i can think of me neither uh, this was a tough list because asian gulf i thought this morning oh my goodness asian gulf i sat there and looked at the list and i go man i could drop it in here in any of these spots shoot i could drop it in the top five that's why i said it's just all kind of fluid and i mean there's so many good games back here that aren't on this list mm -hmm. um tom says he's not sure Leeds did the map good point okay um, yeah, first Hornet leader was GMT. Those old, those old D Dan Verson games were all with GMT originally. Yep. yep. I've um, had a Hornet leader was kind of on my short list as well, but I got to admit as far as those went, it was definitely more this. So. Well, it's funny when I first got in a war game and because of we, the people, I was gobbling up car driven games like crazy. Hmm. And then as that slipped by and Oh, I get the command and colors, the ancients and the Napoleonics expansions. I'd always kind of comment, you know, I don't really get that many GMTs, maybe one or two a year. But shoot, when you look behind me, four of those shells are dedicated to GMT. <laughs> you know? Oh, another one that, you know, it's just like people probably wonder this, Pericles. I've only played it solo. And I was going to play Mark Herman down at that Dallas Con because he told me, man, you really got to play this four plus. It's the way to make it. And I could tell, yeah, it's the way to make it shine. But then, like I said, my kids had band concerts, volleyball stuff. Like, ah, I'm not missing my kids. So I skipped out on that. But uh, there's just so many good games that I haven't got to fully explore Space Empire. I mean, I just, I'm not throwing out on my mention. I'm just saying they make so many good games. This was a tough list to make. And like I said, one week you'd see four of the people on. The next week you'd see Fading Glory, depending on what my tastes are. <laughs> so Tom says he looked and Terry did the map. He just looked. And then Nathaniel has a question. Barton Judd, I should highlight it. Let me get it on here. Uh, Barton Judd, what do you think of GMT's card quality? You know, I, I would say it's not like it stands out for me, but I don't have a problem with it either, would be my opinion. I can't name anybody better than them on, you know, the card thick. To me, it's mostly about the thickness, the rigidity. Okay. See, uh, for me, art, art's in the eye of the beholder, but their cards. Um, I've got a lot of Euro games where the cards are just linen finish, top quality. They're fabulous. And, but I mean, these are great. They're good. They're, I have no problem with them at all. Um, I actually don't think I would want linen finished cards or anything with most of these. So, yeah, the, um, I think people need to realize on cards is they're really expensive to make. If you remember when MMP did the um, Lincoln, Lincoln's War. That thing had a fifty thousand dollar Kickstarter limit. You know, you look at those Worthingtons; they're all like you know twenty five hundred, you know, stuff like that. I think um, Hands in the Sea was like sixteen thousand, but fifty thousand, and it was because of the cards. Unless you're willing to get into a mass produced game, cards are a killer for 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 driving up costs. 
So the thicker the quality of your cards, the more it's really going to drive up the price of that game. So you look at stuff like Rommel in the Desert, those are really, they're almost like paper cards that, I mean, oh, you remember the old Victory Point games. I'm sorry, Victory games. Yes. And even the old Victory Point games, those little thin, bleh. Right. And then, yeah. So then you get something like um, Victory Point games, um, second edition of Empires in America. They're good cards. You know, they figured out how to do the whole China thing. But I always thought for war games, GMT, I mean, I've seen people match them. I think Compass does a pretty good. Actually, I think Tricorn actually had a better overall quality than Ancients did because the pile pieces were like memoir thick. But uh, here's all your sleevers. Yep. <laughs> what do I think of sleeving cards, Judd? What do I think about it? You hate it. You hate, hate it more it. than death in Texas. Like you hate playing it. with you hate it like broccoli. It's like playing with plastic. It's it's uh, it's a card prophylactic that I do not want. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, um, I was trying to think. I can't think of anybody who really tops them. I, they beat some people make good cards, but they're not quite as thick when you hold them up to GMT. So yeah, that's a little thicker. Now the thing is, is man, I don't riffle shuffle any card because I'm always afraid of bending it. Greg's all, you know, his his games are well loved, but. Uh, Man, I just can't bring myself to do that. So, but I think if anything can handle riffle shuffle, it'd be GMT stuff. So I always thought their cards were as good as. Yeah, I get the Eurogamers because they make. Oh shoot, what was it? Ticket to Ride? How many copies they sell that thing? Hundreds of thousands of copies, maybe even a million or something. Yeah, they can mass produce that stuff like crazy. Right. But you're doing Ticket to Ride. Ticket to Ride's four million sold. Yeah, out. you're not going to get the mass discount quantity quality you know value on your cards to batch and queue those things and get a cheap price on them so i always thought they did a good job as anybody or actually i can't name anybody better than them put it that way tom hates tattered cards um i love a well i love kind of i mean i don't want to if the cards are showing hidden information <clears throat> then i don't want a card that's going to stand out yeah, you don't want your first strike card being bent. Right. Yeah. So that, and I get not riffle shuffling. Um, you know, I do a lot of card games in the army. We played spades all the time. Of course, that's just a regular deck. We were riffle shuffling, bridging. We were doing all kinds of stuff, but um, got it. All right. Well, let's sign it off, brother. I thought that all was right. good. We're back. Of course, next Saturday, we'll be back at the 11 a.m. slot. We'll do the Wait, oh, yeah, next, Saturday, that's right. yep, next Saturday, the top five fan. Oh, wait, next Saturday's uh, July 4th, though. Yeah, we can't do that. Let's not do that on July 4th. What do you, um, I think, well, too many people will be out doing stuff, and I'll probably be doing stuff with the family. You with me? Let's, yeah. skip, let's skip the 4th of July. So that'll make it uh, what? Uh, 11th. The 11th. Thank you for doing the head math. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll make it the 11th. We'll come back and do the top five fans version. So um, everybody go into the uh, comments on YouTube if you wish. Throw it on there. I'll put this video up on BGG as well. But it's good to be back. Um, it's good to be hanging out with Judd. And Judd, they've uh, done some StreamYard improvements here. The sound quality is supposed to be up a little bit. And they're saying they're going to have more. And I'm hoping it's going to be 1080p. Uh, this is very convenient. I still like having you sitting right next to me, but it is very convenient the way we do this. And I do like it. Having all that alcohol around, it tempts me. It, it tempts you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you're, I'm always having to like slap your hand off my bottle. Yeah. I get asked, I tell them I'm as close to a teetotaler as you can actually get without being a teetotaler. So. <laughs> all right. Uh, thanks, Bart and Judd. Nathaniel says, let's throw that up. Good to see you, Bart. We've got some of these thumbs up from Lucky. Um, thanks gents from Trevor, uh, Chris Perry, something. Um, I just wanted to give some shouts out Kabuki kid, chow chat gang. Um, excellent. So it's, it's awesome to be back and, uh, and I'm playing some more games now too. So that's nice. So, all right, let's all sign right. it off. All right. Game it. You gamer gods. I'm going to end right. the podcast. We have spoken. <laughs>